a, a great pleasure to be here with so many people. It's, uh, I, I thought it would be a very small audience. It would be terrific to see so many people. And thanks so much to the Institute for inviting me to, to speak to you uh, tonight. Um, my passion has always been snow and ice. As you can probably tell from my accent, I was brought up in England. Not much snow and ice there, so emigration to Canada just over 50 years ago, and have um, witnessed the glaciers in the Rockies um, disappearing in front of our eyes, <laughs> and glaciers uh, around the world uh, doing similarly. Uh, but uh, tonight, I thought I would try to give uh, a broad view of the cryosphere, the snow and ice, on a global with a global perspective, and not just to deal with glaciers, but to deal with uh, pretty well all aspects of, of snow and ice to give a, to give a, a broad overview. Um, this is a, a strange looking uh, map of the world, uh, but um, you can see on the left the largest ice mass in Antarctica, something like 85% of the world's ice there, another 11% or so in uh, Greenland, and um, most of the rest, 4% or so, uh, most of that is in fact in the Arctic islands and small amounts in the rest of the world. You, you may be surprised at those statistics, but the great glaciers of the, the Himalaya, which we'll be talking about, the Andes and so on, constitute in fact a very small part of the global cryosphere. But um, you'll see there in the, uh, oh, my, my hand's too, sh too shaky for this, um, the uh, blue there is the, are the permafrost regions of northern Canada and Russia, <laughs> and the green are the um, yeah, per perennial uh, snowpacks, the seasonal snowpacks, which of course come and go uh, with, with the seasons. So I'll be talking about all these uh, various aspects. There we go. But of course, the, the thing that is driving um, the changes in snow and ice are the rising uh, temperatures worldwide. You're very familiar with these sorts of graphs. Um, in the last hundred years, a uh, marked <coughs> global warming. And um, the snow and ice areas of the world are the ones which are uh, suffering most or most responding to those uh, changes in, in, in temperature. Um, you'll see that uh, not only have mean surface temperatures gone up, that is associated with a rise in global sea level and northern hemisphere snow cover, you can see there, has been uh, going down over the last few decades. Well, let's start up in the uh, Arctic and um, consider, first of all, sea ice extent. I think you're all familiar with these sorts of uh, graphs. Over the last uh, 40 years or so, and before that, if you project backwards, a general decline in uh, ice, sea ice cover. And in this graphic, of course, um, 100 years ago, that was a, a projection backwards in time. But obviously, uh, a decrease in, in the extent of uh, sea ice in the Arctic, leading to and not, not only the, the aerial extent, of course, but the thickness of the ice itself is diminishing too, allowing all sorts of things to happen in the Arctic Ocean, including, as you know, cruises through the Northwest Passage now, now possible, and in fact, in fact, happening. Uh, one of the places where I first uh, studied was uh, Svalbard, uh, way north of uh, Norway. That was my first uh, expedition as, a, as an undergraduate student back in uh, 1963. And um, just uh, last week in The Economist, 
there was a really interesting article on reindeer in, in Svalbard and how they, the reindeer herds, are suffering because of warmer winters. Uh, and the, the suffering is induced by <coughs> rainfall events happening in, during winter when it's supposed to be really cold and there's supposed to be no rain. And that rain percolates through the snowpack and then refreezes into ice layers, leading to uh, starvation of, of the reindeer uh, because they cannot dig through the snow to get to the vegetation uh, underneath. And this has led to lower birth rates. And the question is, uh, are reindeer at a sort of a tipping point? What if you had two winters in a row when uh, there was a lot of uh, rainfall and snow events um, because in 1993 was, there was one very severe incident and the reindeer population fell by about 70% just as a result of that. So here is a, an interesting ecological change uh, associated with the changing um, uh, cryospheric conditions. And in fact it's not only reindeer but it's arctic foxes and it's ptarmigan and uh, other creatures uh, which, that are being uh, uh, affected. affected. Permafrost, of course, as you know, is uh, present in either continuous or discontinuous forms in much of northern Canada, and the permafrost is uh, slowly re retreating northwards. Those maps have to be redrawn, and you're probably familiar with these sorts of um, photographs of slumping uh, of the uh, of the of the sides of the rivers and so on, and presumably having quite an effect on sediment transport in uh, rivers. Effect. This is on the Mackenzie. Effects too on uh, human uh, settlements. Uh, structures are falling over, tilting over. Uh, as a result of uh, permafrost thawing and there are many examples of um, this for example is a pipeline which has been buckled up <laughs> because of the uh, changes in the permafrost and uh, we all hear about these uh, ice roads in, in winter uh, very important for northern communities um, the roads are simply not there in summer and uh, winter transport is, is essential for many uh, distant northern communities. And because winter is becoming shorter and ice is becoming thinner on lakes and, and rivers, then you get situations like this. And this is uh, definitely affecting uh, many of the remote communities in northern Canada. Um, ice jams. I don't know an awful lot about whether ice jams are getting worse or not. I presume that if the ice is thinner and not so much of it, there won't be so many ice jams. But uh, I'm not exactly sure of that. And this is a photo from a colleague of ours, uh, Spiros Belteos, and you can see the effects of uh, ice on, on structures. And as I say, I'm not really sure what changes in uh, ice, I mean, uh, uh, how they're being affected. <coughs> well, let's go to a happy hunting ground of mine and of my good friend uh, Scott Moreau sitting here in the audience and at least one of my PhD students sitting <laughs> just in front of her. Let's go to the, um, the, the Rocky Mountains and uh, have a look at some of the things happening there. On the left, the extent of, of glaciers. Um, on the right, the, the precipitation amounts associated with those glaciers. But this is a really interesting uh, picture of how uh, snow cover is changing in the mountains, the duration of snow cover. Winters are in fact getting shorter. And um, here you see, oh, sorry, the, the, the Rocky Mountains, um, 
in fact, the snow cover is something like uh, two months shorter in, in the Rocky Mountains now than it was uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And this, of course, is having an effect on uh, when the snow melt takes, how, how much snow is to melt, and when the snow does melt, and changes in the, leads to changes in the uh, regime of the rivers, which arguably are important uh, downstream for the use of the water. Well, we're going to the Mistea Basin, which um, if you travel from Banff to Jasper on that glacial uh, highway, you will have gone through the Mistea Basin. It's uh, part of the North Saskatchewan uh, River Basin, and um, it's about 200 uh, square kilometers in size. And within the basin is the Pato Glacier. And um, since 1896, this is the oldest photo that we have, I believe, on, uh, on file. The glacier has retreated. This is its position in 1966, uh, just before uh, I started my work there. And uh, you can see now in 2001 that red line is where it had retreated to then. And since then, it's, it's gone back uh, very much further. This is again in about the year 2000. And here, actually, this is going from 2000 to 2007, a series of uh, images uh, from LIDAR surveys. And you can see that the glacier is, is, is getting smaller. And it's that lower part of the glacier which has um, re retreated and disappeared uh, to such an, a great extent. Well now, as that, that is ice coming out of semi-permanent storage. You, know, you have seasonal storage, uh, seasonal uh, snowfall, which then more or less disappears uh, during the summer. But on top of that snow melt, and on top of the rainfall which occurs during summer, there is a, a, an addition of glacier ice coming out of permanent storage. And uh, that is important for the regime of the rivers, and you can easily appreciate that if the glaciers, the, the more the glaciers disappear, the less water is coming from that source, from that water source. And uh, in, in areas downstream where water is extremely valuable, then that's very important. Um, <clears throat> just to show you the effect that glaciers have uh, on stream flow, we can take uh, the Pato uh, Basin, which I showed you just a moment ago, highly glacier covered, something like 60% glacier covered, in contrast to a very similar sized basin just across the way. And um, uh, Pato is north and east facing, it's in shadow. On the other side of the valley, the slopes are south and west facing, they're in sunshine, in simple terms. <coughs> and so the glaciers are packed on the west side of the valley. Um, and the result is, uh, in, in the discharge, those uh, pato, you can see that uh, striped line, far higher discharge because all the, the glacier is contributing a great deal of water, uh, of water coming out of semi-permanent storage. And you can see that it comes fairly late in the summer with a peak in August. Whereas the uh, Silverhorn Creek, the, uh, the, the basin on the other side, on the sunny side, with almost no glaciers, um, in this, uh, sorry, the open area here, you can see that the the highest flows are in uh, June and July, uh, snowmelt peaks, and there's no influence of, of, of glacier melt. Here's just another example, Pato Creek at the top for one particular year, and 
um, compared to the North Saskatchewan, much further down with much less glacier cover. The Beto has a snowmelt peak here, but the highest flows are late in the summer in, in August, whereas uh, the North Saskatchewan, with a far smaller glacier cover, has a big snowmelt peak, and that's the dominant peak. Nothing else compares to it. You'll see these up and downs here, those are diurnal fluctuations. The glacier melts during the daytime and it sort of shuts down overnight. And this is reflected in the discharge. If you want to cross a glacier fed stream, uh, you cross it really early in the morning. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you, you may be washed away later. And um, that, that, those diurnal fluctuations are really, really prominent, especially late in the summer. And if you were to look at the timing of the exact, the exact timing of the peaks, you'll find that as the summer goes on, the peaks become earlier and earlier. And that is because at the beginning of the season, when the glacier ice has uh, moved and filled up all the crevices and cracks and hollows, the water can't get through very quickly. But once water, melt water starts getting through and it uh, wears away, if you like, at, at the ice, the channels get bigger and the water gets a bit faster. So in fact, uh, as you go on in the season, uh, the daily peaks uh, come earlier and earlier. And again, um, on the top, a 1% glacier covered catchment, the timing of the peak early in the season because it's snow melt dominated. At the bottom, a highly glacier covered catchment with um, much later peaks. And here, here again, you'll see that, well, this is the Bow River at Banff. Quite big differences one year to another in the, dis the monthly discharge. These are monthly figures. Um, in, a, in 1970, there was very little snow, so the snow, snow melt peak is quite low compared to, say, 1972, when there was a lot more snow. But because there was very little snow, the glacier ice became bare much earlier, and ice melted. And here's the contribution of ice melt. Very large contribution relative to other years, in a year when there's very little snow. So this is, so the, the glacier melt, in fact, compensates for low snow, uh, which is very important uh, in the month of August. Half of the total flow in August for the Bow River at Banff comes from melting glacier ice. And again, you can imagine if uh, the glaciers are getting smaller and smaller, that contribution is going to become less and less. So the buffering effect, the benefits of buffering, the benefits of glaciers are going to be uh, less and less through time. And again, you can see this is the total flow um, at the Bow River at Banff. And this is the glacier contribution down here. Sometimes there are positive, mostly there are positive um, contributions of glacier ice melt. But there are some years when the glaciers, in fact, are growing. They, it, it's, not a, it's not every year that the glaciers are going to become smaller and smaller. Even, even now, the glacier can get a little bigger on some years, but it's unusual. Okay, and this is the Columbia ice fields, 1990 and 2000. Uh, this is... Uh, the famous Athabasca Glacier here, the Saskatchewan <coughs> Glacier, and just for that 10-year example, you can see how the glaciers have been retreating. Well, now, we're going to move to other parts of the world. And um, this is in Switzerland, the largest glacier in the Alps, the Aletsch Glacier. Um, uh, and the waters from it and the surrounding uh, hill slopes uh, feed hydroelectric power stations. And uh, had an interesting experience here back in the early 70s when I visited um, right up here 
on the Jungfrau fern, it was covered in pink. What was this? Well, it was dust from the Sahara. And it gets occasionally gets blown, covers the glaciers, and greatly affects the albedo, and contributes to uh, melting. And in fact, I think it was just in this last year that it's been a similar sort of uh, Sirocco uh, a wind event from, from the Sahara. And um, again, this is the same area, and it just shows how the glacier and its surrounding glaciers had retreated from, uh, and this affects uh, the amount of water available and the timing of water availability for hydropower production uh, downstream. Go briefly to Africa, to the snows of Kilimanjaro, and a couple of pictures taken from pretty well the same aspect in 1930 and 2005. And the big ice mass on, on, on the summit um, has been uh, diminishing very greatly. Uh, with effects, of course, downstream, this is in Amwazilin Park in, in Kenya, and the snows of Kilimanjaro, not nearly so um, extensive, and therefore not so much water given to the streams which come down onto the plains below and have effects on the whole ecological systems. So here is the cryosphere, even in Africa, having an effect on uh, on ecosystems. And thank you just briefly. Uh, th this is uh, a, a volcano, Villarica, in central Chile, which we visited in uh, 1984. And it was just before a major eruption. <coughs> and here is the juxtaposition of fire and uh, ice because from our hotel we could actually see streams of red lava coming down through the glacier ice. And uh, uh, quite a, an interesting phenomenon was that uh, it would blow smoke rings. Uh, it really does blow smoke rings. You know? and, and in fact, I, I haven't got it in my collection of pictures, but we saw many smoke rings uh, all at once uh, in the sky. Well, we're coming to my second area of uh, major work that I undertook in the Himalaya, uh, but particularly in the Karakoram Mountains in northern Pakistan, in, in Kashmir. There, there are the largest glaciers between 50 degrees north and 50 degrees south. They are, in fact, the, the glaciers of the Karakoram are, in fact, considerably larger than the glaciers uh, in, the, in the rest of the Himalayan chain. And uh, that's really because the Himalayas are a whole series of very steep uh, peaks. Whereas uh, in, the, in the Karakoram, <coughs> there's a great deal of land continuously at very high elevation and uh, supporting, therefore, able to support many more uh, glaciers. Um, whereas in, uh, in the Rockies and in Western Canada and most mid-latitude situations, you get precipitation at all times of the year. In winter, of course, it mainly falls as snow. In summer, it falls as rain. But there's no great seasonal difference. Well, that's very different in, in the Himalaya because, as you know, they have the monsoon which comes in uh, July through June or July through uh, September. And the rest of the year is very, very dry. And so, funnily enough, that time of the year in the summer is the time where you have deluges of rainfall. And at the same time, high up, you have accumulation of large amounts of snow. Um, so the the climatic situation is, is different, but it's different within this range too, because as you go westwards from uh, this part, uh, Sikkim and Bhutan, uh, westwards, so the monsoon becomes less and less dominant, and the Karakoram themselves 
in here are in fact shielded from most of the monsoon rains by this front range, mountains like Nanga Polbat. And uh, once you get into the Karakoram, then there's a lot of winter snowfall. Snowfall which is derived from cyclones coming all the way across uh, from the Atlantic. So the, I'm, the point I'm making is that the climate is not the same in, in all mountain areas of the world. And that has effects on the discharge of the rivers down, downstream. And here's just another depiction of that same area, the Karakoram up here. Here are the Himalaya, snow-covered, and this is the subcontinent continent, uh, down here. And here is the central uh, Karakoram, and I'll just take you to uh, the Biafo Glacier, which was one of the glaciers that we studied, uh, 560 square kilometers, uh, much larger, that glacier alone, than, say, the Columbia ice fields. And, um, about 60 kilometers of the valley, ranging from 2,500 meters elevation. But once you get into the snow lake up here, you're up with mountains above uh, 7,000 meters. And um, one of our good colleagues, uh, Ken Hewitt, at Wilfrid Laurier University, with whom I've worked ex extensively, um, has th this is a map of his showing glacier dammed lakes. Now, in the Karakoram, there are lots of glaciers which surge every so often, every 10, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on the size of the glacier. The glacier will suddenly surge forward um, and sometimes run right across a valley and block it. And then the river flowing down that valley will form a lake behind, and eventually the ice dam will uh, break. Uh, usually it's water going underneath the ice, the ice essentially floating on the water, and that can initiate huge floods. And um, there was a case in, or two cases in the 1920s, on the Shyok River, way up here, that uh, there were two successive uh, Iceland floods and the water took four days to travel down to Atok, which is the, where the mountain waters divulge onto the Indus Plains. It took four days to come down, but even then the river stage, that is the height of the river, the height of the surface of the water, uh, went up 18 meters, uh, which, is, which is huge. And um, there was a case in 1841 of a, an army uh, camped on, on the plains down below, uh, and they were washed away suddenly, because this can come uh, really quickly. And there are lots of examples of that. So um, the, the changes in the shape of glaciers can really influence in this case, the development of uh, floods. Uh, or just a few pretty pictures of the difficulty of getting there to do field work is somebody crossing on, on a rope bridge. And um, this is the way you sometimes have to cross rivers, being pulled across on these little trolley things. And uh, I made a mistake of grabbing onto the wire and of course, takes all the skin off your hands if you're stupid enough to do that. <laughs> and here we are walking up the Biafo Glacier. It took uh, six days to walk up that first section. And um, then we get into the snow fields at the top. And in fact, what we were interested in doing there was to take uh, snow cores because up at that high elevation, uh, above about 5,000 meters, it's in the so-called dry snow zone. There's never any melt. Well, maybe there's going to be melt if the temperatures keep on rising. But it's the dry snow zone, and so each annual layer is well preserved. And you can core down through those layers, 
and you can say, okay, last year there was so much snow, the next year there was so much, the next year, and so on. And you can get a very good idea of the total precipitation uh, up at that elevation. And you may say, well, <coughs> Uh, doesn't, aren't there avalanches and aren't there, doesn't snow blow around and, and contaminate the records? Well, this snow zone up there is so large, 300 square kilometers, that you can go to places where there are no avalanches and the snow blowing in equals roughly the snow blowing out. And so you can get a very good idea of the, accumul of the precipitation at those high levels. And it is at the high levels that the precipitation occurs. Right down in the valleys, it's very, very dry. Virtually no precipitation. It's in the very high areas where the precipitation does, does occur. And I'll just take you to the Everest area. Uh, Everest is, this is the Kumbu Glacier here. Everest is in around here. And um, <clears throat> You may be able to see little blue places. These are little lakes. One there, there's one uh, over here. And um, I'll show you that first one, the Inja Lake. These are lakes which are uh, the result of glaciers retreating, melting, producing water. And the water is ponded back by the lateral and terminal moraines. And you can imagine that as the glacier retreats, as it melts, so those lakes are going to get larger. And you can also imagine that if there's a major landslide from these extremely steep slopes, <coughs> the water will very suddenly be displaced and it will swap down the valley below. These are called glacial lake outburst floods. And they can be a very short-lived, but very, very intense. And they're a real concern for many of the uh, villages down below. And this is one such uh, documented case called the Deep Cho. It's another little lake here. In 1985, it suddenly broke loose. Water swept down the valley. And because it's such a lot of water going down at once, it doesn't just go straight down the valley, but it slops up this side and up that side as it goes down. And it can take out bridges which are 10, 20 meters above uh, the water level, the normal water level. So um, <clears throat> this is an effect, a cryospheric effect on the uh, lives of, uh, of, of people. Oh, this is just the largest glacier in, in uh, the Himalaya, the Ngozumpo Glacier, and uh, we went up a, a small peak here at about 5,500 meters, and from there you can see four of the highest mountains in the world, and you get a very good view of uh, Everest and uh, Nupsi and Lhotse. Uh, the evening sunset. Uh, just one more example from uh, Central Asia. In the Kilian Mountains, uh, north of the Tibetan Plateau, um, <clears throat> and here the glaciers in these, this mountain range is, has peaks of 6,000 meters, way higher than anything in uh, Canada. Um, and the glaciers here are also retreating. And in fact, um, these are the mountains with the big river, the High Hay River, uh, debauching onto the plains. This is the scale up here, 100 kilometers. And all these little towns or villages were part of the famous Silk Route uh, connecting China to uh, Persia in the, in the far distance past, but uh, the flow of those of that river has dramatically decreased, uh, leading to um, the more or less the disappearance of a huge lake and uh, uh, 
wetland area uh, up there, 1927 versus 2002. The 1927 picture is rather uh, fuzzy, but I think you can see that uh, there was a very large lake up there and it's disappeared almost to nothing uh, nowadays. Well, I'm going to uh, finish <coughs> by <coughs> taking you to Antarctica, <coughs> where, as I said, most of the ice in the world is uh, rest, and to the relatively small West Antarctic, relatively small <laughs> West Antarctic uh, ice sheet compared to the East Antarctic. And, of course, there is, as you know, a great concern that if uh, some of these ice shells, which are floating on the sea, if they do uh, break up, then they will release, take out the plug, if you like, from glaciers uh, flowing into uh, those areas and perhaps lead to instability and um, therefore a, a huge amount of ice going into the ocean uh, and with a consequent rise in sea level. There's one particular glacier called the Thwaites Glacier, which is really an ice stream within the West Antarctic uh, ice shelf. And, and here it is. This is the ice stream of the Thwaites. It's, um, its front is about 125 kilometers long and it's going at in more than um, a kilometer a year into the sea and there's a, there's a similar but slightly smaller one up here, Pine Island and it is estimated, I'm really not sure how accurate this is but it's estimated that the Thwaites Glacier alone is already contributing 10% of global sea level rise. As I say, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, or how precise that is, but even if it's only approximately correct, then that is really significant. If the Thwaites are completely melted, then it alone could raise sea level by about half a metre. And as you know, if the, if the Greenland ice completely melts, which is unlikely in the next few hundred years, but possible, uh, if that all melted, some meters rise in sea level. And so we, we, we should be concerned about those sorts of things, because many of the world's very large cities are right down at sea level. And these um, economic and uh, considerations have, have been developed. And they've listed here the, the 20 cities most at danger. And here's Mumbai. And this, this is a few years ago that this was done. But anyway, nearly 3 million people uh, would be displaced with economic consequences of so many millions of, of uh, dollars or whatever they financial units is. Um, it's interesting you'll see that Miami is number four in importance and yet uh, <laughs> Miami keeps on being developed. Um, <laughs> tell me why. <laughs> well, I haven't covered all the various aspects of the global cryosphere. I haven't talked about avalanches and various other things. But uh, hopefully that's given you some uh, food for thought. Back on the Columbia ice fields in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs>